Okay, okay we're good live. Okay, good evening, everyone. This will begin the public hearing for the November 18th, 2021 zoning board hearing. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to the chair. Thank you, Matt. Give me one second. I'm very discombobulated right now. Okay. No, you're good. <laughs> all right. Well, let's make sure Hilton's Wi-Fi stays with me all night. So good evening, everyone. So for over a year, we've been conducting our zoning board meetings virtually as authorized by the state of New York disaster emergency declaration and executive orders, the local emergency orders issued by the mayor of the city of Rochester and amendments to the zoning board rules and procedures. Primarily these orders and amendments waive the requirements for in-person attendance at this hearing and permit us to hold the hearing by teleconference, allow applicant presentations by teleconference and allow public comments to be submitted by email, by hard copy document mailed to the zoning office or deposited in the secure drop box located in the link entrance or in the permit office of city hall or by call into this hearing. Written public comments and requests to schedule the call in comments were all required to be submitted by 5 p.m. yesterday. Although the conduct of this hearing has been altered, many things remain the same. All the normal notifications for this hearing, including mail notice, publication, and the public and the posting of notice were all followed. All the normal timeframes for applicant presentations and public comments remain the same. The normal staff report was prepared and posted on the city website. And most importantly, this board will hear, review, and make decisions about all the applications with the same diligence and using the same standards required by the zoning code. Before we begin the hearing, I would like to explain the ground rules of the hearing. When a case is called, the applicant will have 15 minutes to present their case to the board. The applications and full staff reports were all posted on the city website at least a week ago and were available for the public to review. As the application is being presented, staff will identify and show the pages of the application that the applicant is addressing. Following our normal procedure, the board members may ask the applicant questions about the application. After the applicant's presentation is completed, any scheduled calling comments will be heard. Any comments received after the staff report was posted on the city's website have been provided to all the board members and have been posted on the city's website. Comments will be limited to 10 minutes if submitted by a neighborhood association and three minutes for individuals. And the reading of submitted comments will be summarized to fit within these timeframes. If multiple written submissions repeat the same comments, the staff will summarize those comments. After the call in comments have been heard and written comments have been read, the applicant will have five minutes to provide rebuttal testimony. At the conclusion of the applicant's rebuttal, the case will be closed. After completing all of the hearings on the agenda tonight, the board may take a short break, which will be announced. After the break, the board will commence deliberations and voting on all applications, except any application that has been adjourned to another meeting. Please note that if your case is approved today, a written decision will be mailed to you within 15 business days. The decision will inform you of the next steps to complete the approval process. Before we open the first case, please note that we are all volunteers. I would like each of the board members to confirm their presence for purpose of a roll call and establishing a quorum for this hearing. And they'll introduce themselves and they'll mention their area of expertise and they'll let you know where they come from in the city. So we'll start with my friend, Matt. Go right ahead, Matt, introduce yourself. Hi, this is Matt Bain. I live in the Northwest Quadrant. Uh, my area of focus is real estate investing. Thanks, Matt. David? Uh, my name is David Carr. I live in the Northeast part of the city. I'm in uh, consulting and development. Thank you, David. Cora? Good evening. My name is Cora Murphy. I'm in the Northwest and I'm a licensed real estate broker. Thank you, Joe. Uh, my name is Joe O'Donnell. I live in the Northeast section of the city and I'm a practicing architect. Thanks, Joe. Holly? Hi, my name is Holly Wheeler. I work in higher education and I live in the East District of the city. Thanks, Holly. And um, I'm Tyrese Bryant. I have a background in urban planning. I work in real estate and land use development and I live in Southwest Rochester. So uh, thank you, everybody. So Matt, let's get rolling on this. 
Yeah, we'll do that in just one second. I want to make one clarification. Um, um, staff are not going to be reading um, the public comment that came in, in addition. Let me, let me try this again. Staff will not be reading the additional public comment that came in after the staff report. Um, the additional public comment was uh, several things provided to the board members for their review. It was also posted on the city's website last evening at the close of the public comment period. Um, so any of the additional public comment is accessible on the city's land use board um, website for anyone to view, and it has all been entered into the record as part of the applications this evening. Um, okay, great. Did you so write we'll that in the comment that I you wrote that in the new one you sent me. I made an update, but I I just did that other one off the cuff just now. <laughs> oh, okay, no, because yeah. I was like, didn't you tell me? And I just read. It. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. I don't go think ahead. I updated a, another part of it. Was the issue? Okay, um, but no worries. Um, I heard it and I thought, uh, um, okay, case number one is a return case from the October hearing. It is file V-01721122. It's an area variance request at 780 Dewey Avenue located in the C2 Community Center District. The applicant is uh, Stephanie from ProSigns and there's a team of people here tonight who can all get sworn in in just a second. Um, and the purpose is to replace a series of signs, both attached and detached, for Sunoco exceeding certain sign limitations. And we have uh, a Rob, and we have we have two individuals, and the other individual, I'm not going to try to pronounce your name because is Stephanie here. This was um, case one. The two individuals here were here from case one. Can you unmute yourselves and um, introduce yourselves? This um, uh, uh, Jessica Davis was the person who was here last month who had gotten the link. Right. This is uh, this is Rob Grimm. I'm with Snoco LP. Oh, OK. Rob, are you doing all the talking tonight? I'll be doing most of the talking. Uh, Jag Dollywell is the dealer at the location. And he has joined the call as well. Is he going to be speaking? Um, he may. I think he might have a question or two um, at the end here. Okay. So just the two of you. Let's get started because I don't want to waste any more time. So why don't you both raise your right hand? Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. 15 minutes. Go right ahead. Okay. This is a follow-up from our meeting on October 21st. Uh, Jessica Davis was in attendance at that point. Um, at, at that previous meeting, uh, there was uh, some things that uh, required more, more clearance, um, and we needed to do some revised drawings to, uh, to meet some of the criteria that the, uh, the city was, was expecting. So what we did is we submitted a new drawing for uh, multiple things at the site. Um, number one, uh, the existing canopy that is there right now after meeting uh, with everyone the last time, um, we scaled back the scaled back the imaging on canopy number one to just have an illuminated Sun Sunoco word mark, um, as you can see on the uh, picture here. And that illuminated Sunoco word mark will be facing Dewey Avenue. Um, the second one was on the new canopy that we were, are putting in at the site. And in this case here, um, we are removing, there's, there's going to be only one Sunoco diamond sign that's going to be towards facing towards the Lexington Avenue area. So now, we, so we cut it back um, from I believe it was four illuminated signs between the two canopies to just two illuminated signs um, on these two canopies here now. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that was discussed on the previous meeting and that was, I believe, what was going to be acceptable to the board. Uh, the next piece was in regards to the The sign there, yes, right there. So what we've actually done is we've put in for um, a six foot sign 
um, as opposed to the four foot sign that was um, in section 120-177D. Uh, the reason why we did that was uh, bringing it down from the 18 foot sign that we've got right now, bringing it down to six foot instead of four um, due to the fact that we believe when there's snow removal and such during the winter months that, that the digits on that sign, if it's four foot, will not be visible to the public. So we're requesting that to be actually six foot instead of four foot. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that is pretty much it. The only other, the only other um, proposal that we've got here was on the building itself which was going to have a building band, a blue building band, and a vinyl, the words vinyl, uh, food mart and vinyl letters on there. That will not be an illuminated, uh, that will not be an illuminated sign on there. And that will replace the existing building band that is currently there right now. That actually concludes what we are looking to do and I, I believe it matches what uh, the the city was requiring of us as far as scaling back the imaging project at the site anything else rob um no i believe that's it um i think jag may have a uh, have a question as it relates to the monument sign there though okay jag if you are on mute or you can unmute yourself if uh, if you are on mute this is Matt Staff. I don't see him on the call anymore. He must have dropped off. Okay. Okay. So let's, we're going to keep moving. Um, so, board. Oh, I'm going to interrupt real quick. We have Jag. Just give us one second to promote him. Okay. All righty. While we're doing that, Rob, can you give me your last name so I can enter that in for the decision? Yeah, it's Grim, G R I M M. Thank you. Jack, okay, you can unmute a... yourself. Hello? Hi, Jag, how are you? All right, how are you? I'm well, I'm well. Welcome to the Zoning Board of Appeals. I hear you have a question for the board. Go right ahead before we uh, ask yes. you some questions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, about the, I know we have to lower the sign, but one of those poles, can we have one side pole higher to keep it same height because I have two two cameras mounted on it that uh, kind of uh, monitor the whole parking lot on both sides. And uh, it helps us keep our customers safe. And also and city police uses that system more than me. And if we were to cut those, uh, I mean, we can cut one side pole down, but the, if we can keep one side up, that would be helpful. If we cut that down, then I don't know where I'm going to mount those cameras. And if we do mount the cameras, I'm going to have to mount six camera, maybe six, seven cameras to mount the whole, uh, to monitor the whole parking lot instead of just having two cameras. Matt, you want to address that? Yeah, I'm trying to find my mute button. Um, yeah, so. If you're talking about keeping a, a sign post, that's a little different than putting a post to mount cameras. If you need a place to mount cameras somewhere on the property by putting a post in, um, that wouldn't be related to this. The problem with no, leaving... No. Oh, yeah? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Sorry for... Yeah, just the problem with leaving a sign post there is any future user of the site sees it as a former sign post and therefore thinks they have right to another pole sign and then the sign doesn't ever come down. So the best way to handle that, if you're proposing what I'm circling on the screen here with the detached monument sign, is you can install your cameras on a separate post somehow. So what would happen is you'd cut these posts down. You could use this sign if it meets with the same dimension for width, and then you'd have to put something in to use for the camera, if that's what you're referring to. So we can put another, install another post right next to it? To yeah. Leave or Correct, because the idea would be to, I, I assume what you're trying to do is cut these, what I'm showing on the screen here, to use the existing base and the existing, is that accurate? Yeah, because one of these, uh, yeah, one of these poles is, is this side, 
there are two cameras mounted on it on top of it that are monitoring okay. the parking lot both directions. Okay. So what you could do is work with me on something, some sort of separate post or some sort of mounting system to get the cameras back in place. Okay. So, but we, we won't be able to, I mean, even if we go separate pole, it can't be as high as the current pole or is it going to have to be? be well, we wouldn't, shorter? we wouldn't consider it. We wouldn't consider it part of the sign. So if you're cutting down these existing posts for the sign, we'd have you do some sort of a, a separate pole. Um, but likely not something like metal like this. It might be something, might be something different. You'd have to tell me what's available. I just don't know. Um, and we could work I mean, with you on can that. Be, can it be same as the height as this current pole? Yes, it, yes. So it'd be just like putting lighting features in the property. So it'd be no different than you putting like a post here to do some down lighting for, for evening time, that kind of thing. So yes, it could be, it could be raised up higher than the six feet. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. All right. So Rob and Jag, we're going to open it up for questions for the board. We're looking at, you know, three variances here. The height of the, the height of this detached sign, the variance on uh, the canopy for the canopy, which isn't allowed, and the amount of signs that are allowed on the faces of a detached sign. So I'm gonna open it up for the board and I don't know who's gonna steer it, but just answer them as they come along. So uh, why don't we start with you, Matt? You got any questions? No questions. Uh, David, any questions? Matt and David aren't voting on this one because they weren't here last time. Oh, I'm sorry. So they're okay. excused. I'm, I'm, I didn't know that. Okay. Um, Cora, any questions? No, I don't have any questions. <clears throat> Joe, any questions? No, I'm all set. And Holly, any questions? Nope, I'm all set too. And I don't have any questions as well. Uh, thank you for making the revisions. Really appreciate you taking our comments um, seriously and coming right. back. So thank you, Rob and Jag. Um, yeah, we, do we have any public comment? No, nothing for 780 Dewey. Okay, thank you both. Um, have a great Thanksgiving. Yeah, thank you too. You. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. All right, case number two is uh, held from the agenda last month. It was not heard. Uh, it's file number V-018-2122. It's an area variance request at 52 Harlem Street. The property is located in the R2 medium density residential district. The applicant is the property owner, Scott Piazesny, and the purpose is to convert an existing garage to a single family dwelling, not meeting certain lot area and yard requirements or off street parking requirements. And we have... Sorry, I'm back. We also we have uh, both the property owner Scott coming in as well as uh, Milton Pichardo, who is the architect on the uh, property. So we've got and Scott, we've got Milton. You said yes, Scott and Milton. And when you guys, uh, I see Scott's in here. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. And Milton is on his way. Milton's in here now as well. Hi guys, how Hi. are you? How you doing, Scott? I'm great. How are you guys doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I was walking in your backyard the other day. <laughs> um, so let me swear you in. Let's get started. Can you okay. both raise your right hand? Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. 15 minutes. The floor is yours. I do. Well, first, I'd like to thank you guys for taking your time out of your busy schedules to volunteer and hear all of our motions. Um, we are looking to finish off part of the lower half of the uh, carriage house. Currently the upper half is already uh, finished space. It's kind of used as like a, just a great room. We have movie nights and stuff out here, but we'd like to convert it into, you know, a more usable space if we have family visiting in town or uh, possibly rent it long-term. We would just like to add a had a, a full kitchen and bathroom in the lower right half of the garage. Currently, the picture that's up on the page shows the the man door in the middle. We were looking to remove that man door, and that would be a kitchen window. And then the man door would be removed 
and it would be on the right half on the single car garage portion of the carriage house. So there still would be parking inside the garage on the left half that would stay active. And uh, there would also be parking outside of the garage too. I know the parking has been a, a big topic with a few of the neighbors that wrote in with the uh, concerns about that, which I completely understand. Um, with that being said, I think this opportunity to, you know, use this existing structure to add more, to add another unit in the city would be, uh, would be, would help the current housing situation. Um, and it's just a space that we think is very unique. Anyone that's ever been in the house has always asked, what is that? What's that? You know, not many people get to see a carriage house or have ever been in one and, uh, I think it's just a unique part of the property that we'd like to share with the community and it could help people looking for housing. So that's basically all I have, unless you guys have some questions in regards to this. Yeah, great. Um, let's jump right into it. Let's start with my friend. Um, oh, I don't know if he's my friend, David. <laughs> you got a good point there. <laughs> Uh, yes, one question, please. Um, for the um, entrance for on the uh, garage, the double double door garage that you're going to continue to keep and leave as a garage, is there going to be an entrance door in there to go into the apartment? It would be an entrance door that goes into the apartment. So the right half of the garage would be that would be like a dining kitchen uh, and also a uh -huh. bathroom. For the house where, so where would the interest be for the uh other you know from the uh single family or by the single door garage who would the interest be in that type of thing but you need to me two two means of regress how would people get in and out that's my only question uh i think milton might like be. yeah yeah no, right now the main entrance will be where i think matt is is um yeah right showing here. the arrow that will be the uh, main entrance Yep. Have you made entrance? And then yep. also and then one there's, there's another entrance. There's another exit on the uh, right on the back, right before the mechanical room. That one uh -huh. will go up. Okay. That's what I just want to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. I, I think it's a great project. <laughs> <laughs> Cora? Um, David actually asked exactly what I was wondering. Um, so I think I'm good right now. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Joe. Uh, just want to make sure I understand the drawings. It, so it's one, one uh, unit, right? But now it's first and second floor? Correct, yes. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's all I have for right now. Thank you, Joe. Holly? Can you just clarify the parking for me? The parking is not changing from what you currently have, right? Um, so there's, there's the, the left half of the garage is staying parking and then the parking, there would be also parking spaces outside in front and to the right. Um, there is that smaller garage door on the right half that would be removed to be turned into part of the, um, into part of the apartment. So that would be removed. That's not currently used as parking. It's just basically storage. Um, okay. I personally believe there's enough room for three vehicles on in the back lot. There's two spots outside and one inside the garage. Okay, thank you. That's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure I understood. Okay. That, that's right. my only question. All Can right, thank you. Real quick. Go right ahead. So we're so we're keeping the one garage door. We're turning those two doors into <laughs> a kitchen window. We're moving the garage door, putting in some new windows, and that's gonna be like a dining area, correct? Uh the the one garage door on the right, the smaller one, the single car is going to turn into the new entrance into the unit. That will be uh, okay. a man door with probably side lights and that will be walking into an, an entryway and also the dining room um, portion of the uh, lower half of the uh, garage. Okay, so then you have, <clears throat> excuse me, kitchen, bathroom, dining area, downstairs, and then just kind of open space upstairs. Exactly. Correct. It'd be, yeah, a, basically an open flat area. Upstairs would also be like a living room and bedroom. It'd be more of just an open space. Um, like a lofty. Okay. Yes, uh, basically a loft. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Holly? 
you already asked me and I already asked my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. I'm going, sorry. You can tell I'm catching up on getting up at 4.30 today. So, uh, Matt. Yes, sir. Um, just one question, out of, more so out of curiosity. Is that area going to be, are you planning to uh, heat the area? Truly just yes. out of curiosity. Yep. Uh, currently, there's a pellet stove in the upper half of the garage, which is used on a seasonal basis. Uh, we're looking to do uh, mini split units. So um, it would be heat and AC via the mini split. And also the pellet stove is going to stay as secondary heat option. Gotcha. That's all I have. Okay. Scott, the only question I have is I want you to just for a second, um, just talk a bit more about um, just the character of what you're trying to do here and talk about, you know, how, you know, I know you wrote in your statement of difficulty. I know we got a lot, we got quite a few, you know, uh, cust uh, quite a few um comments from the public. So can you just talk a bit about, um, you know, how this is in character with the neighborhood, how it's not going to create a significant change? Can you just speak about that a bit more in your oral testimony? Yeah, I don't feel it's going to change the character of the neighborhood much at all, because it's already an existing structure. It was built, I believe, in the late 1800s or early 1900s. Um, so as, as far as the structure and layout on the property, nothing is going to change besides moving a door and a window. Um, so there'd be really no drastic changes to the neighborhood. Um, you, you, we might have one more car on the property. That's about it. Out of our, we live in the front half of the house right now. And of the three tenants that live upstairs, there's only one tenant that has a car. So everyone else walks, bikes. Um, I think, that's a major concern of other people that have written in from the uh, neighborhood, yeah, but no it is a, it's a very walkable, bikeable area. And a lot of people don't have vehicles down here that, yeah. that we do have living here. Um, I think that's one positive to the area and it, it would bring more people in to support businesses and especially on Park Ave, all the restaurants and bars. So I, I think the best benefit to this property is it's already here, it's existing and we're not really doing any major construction that would be even a noise complaint from neighbors because it's all it's all inside it's all contained yeah. so thank you scott no that was perfect that's exactly okay. what i wanted you to do and you did a good job uh, all right matt, thank you matt we got any comments from the public anybody calling we, in yeah we do i just want to say one thing real quick because yeah. scott touched on something that i said was an error in the pre-meeting i had said it was used for storage and he had just offered testimony about the space being used as sort of a rec space and I should clarify, the existing zoning code for accessory uses and structures does permit in the rear yard people to have like a, a guest house style use. Um, it just can't have kitchen um, appurtenances, so which would lead it to be an actual dwelling unit. But having, having a garage in the rear yard converted to like a, a rec space for the person living in the main structure mm -hmm. without having a kitchen, but like having a bathroom is something that's existing or is something that's permitted currently. So what's happening now is not an issue. Um, this before you tonight with adding in the actual kitchen aspect of it makes it an actual separate dwelling unit. And because variance is run with the property, um, it could certainly stay should Scott choose to sell the property. So I just wanted to make that clarification um, and also for the board members to um, make that note as well. And we do have one commenter uh, John Lembach Call signed up to speak. Yeah, I called in. Yeah, I haven't heard from him in a while. It'd be good. Should be coming in here in just a second. Um, hey, Matt. John, yep, go ahead, John. Are you there? Do I have a swear in? Yeah, yep, oh, didn't know you were there. So, yeah. Um, John, go ahead and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I swear. Are you speaking as an individual or as a representative of a community association? On behalf of the Park Meigs Neighborhood Association. Go right ahead, John. Uh, this is an interesting pop property. Uh, it was purchased by the prior owner from a, uh, a longtime resident, uh, the prior owner to this current owner uh, had done a lot of renovation on the property. Uh, he converted the carriage barn into a uh, 
entertainment area for his hobbies. Uh, he was an avid motorcyclist, belonged to a motorcycle club, and that explains what happened uh, to the second floor of this. Uh, I've been in the place several times myself, so I'm familiar. Uh, he also added a de uh, deck in the rear yard as well. Um, I don't believe any of this was done with a permit. Uh, people commonly um, use their garage as an entertainment space or outside party space or, you know, for overflow. I know I do the same with my garage as well, especially during these times of COVID, we can get more separation going on. Uh, however, there is a major problem with parking in the neighborhood. There are many houses in the neighborhood that do not have driveways, and even some of the ones that do have too many cars for the driveways they have. Uh, we've done surveys over the last several years, uh, periodically during the course of the year, especially in the spring, and we're finding on this particular block is 100% occupied after the hours uh, between uh, roughly 9 o'clock and 7 a.m. Uh, during the daytime, it's rather sporadic, but it seems to pick up around four o'clock in the afternoon. And during the hours of five to about eight o'clock, uh, the streets are parked on both sides, even though they're not supposed to be because of all the restaurant traffic on Park Avenue. So uh, there is no room for anyone else to do that. We've heard complaints for decades about the parking of problems in the uh, Brighton, Harlem, Oxford Street and Park Avenue area. Uh, Goodman Street doesn't offer any relief either because it's a couple large multi-story apartment buildings over there that have very little parking, if any, in some cases out there. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, this was a good solution for the housing problem in the city, uh, city of Rochester. I'm just starting to study some of the census study uh, figures that are going on in the city of Rochester. And according to New York State and the city uh, recent uh, survey for um, rent control out there, there's something like 10,000 vacant dwelling units in the city. I don't see where this particular property is going to fill an urgent need out there or alleviate some of the housing problems that are uh, perceived to happen in the city out there. Uh, it's, you know, an interesting house and uh, we wish the, the client well, but there is no prediction what's going to happen in the future use out there. If there's another apartment added, there could be two or three people in the apartment as there is in the one uh, in the uh, owner's house right now, in addition to his, and there's no concept of how, how many cars are going to be actually used for their uh, particular property. Uh, I know the idea of mass, trans mass transportation is sort of very popular. It's sort of predicted that we're in the future not going to have cars. But then again, a lot of the pollution problems, the cars are going the way of the advent of electric cars. And nobody wants to go up their personal transportation because the mass transportation is very inconvenient and time consuming to say the least. Uh, people do enjoy their freedom, be able to move around the area and a car is really necessary in this part of the state in order to be able to do that. We're not New York City or something like that. So, um, you know, the property is in pretty good shape uh, over at this point right now, but we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. In order to maintain the parking spaces, uh, that the uh, applicant would like to uh, keep at this point, he's going to have to add more uh, paving in the backyard. And there's an area that shows in the photograph is, um, is grass. I don't think it's a very good thing to be parking on grass. So uh, the property already has several uh, deficiencies regarding the zoning code for setbacks, but it's over paved substantially between the building footprint and the actual driveway. Uh, you're being asked to make several large variances out here, but we don't see where they're warranted. Um, our board has discussed this case at length over the last couple of months, and that's a consistent opinion from people at this point. So we're re requesting that this application be denied. Thank you. Hey, thank you, John. Good to hear from you. I hope all is well. Um, Very well. Any, any other comments, Matt, from the public? No, no one else signed up to speak. Scott, you can rebut if you would like. You got five minutes, or you, or we can close the case. Up to you, Scott. If you don't mind me uh, saying something, and and I'll, I I want to thank the board for taking the time to be here. But I agree with the comment that Scott made when it comes to um, the comprehensive plan and what we're trying to do as a city, which is essentially trying to create a little more density. And this is an existing structure that uh, is, is um, suitable for the reason that we're using um, on the case that it is a non-negotiable to add the parking, I recommend to maybe approve with conditions and I will work with Scott to make sure that he paved 
the space and add the parking that we have, we are also talking about it's only one parking uh, and we are very close to downtown and um, Park Avenue. So if, if we trying to follow the comprehensive plan, I think this is a suitable, I really think it's a suitable project and a suitable uh, location for what Scott is trying to do here. Um, that is just a comment that I have. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no, I just want to thank Milton for his input. I obviously agree with what he's had to say. Um, if I had to add parking, I would. Um, but I guess we'll we can't see. Let cars, we can't let cars dictate development. That's what I say. So let's close yeah, the I case. Agree I, with think you. That, I think that's the best <laughs> thing you guys should do is close the case. So uh, thank you guys. Um, and uh, uh, have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Thank guys. You everyone. Bye. Okay, case number three is a return case from last month that was held by the board. Uh, it is file V-019-2122. It's an area variance request at 181 Kirkland Road. The zoning district is R1 low density residential district. The applicant is Miraline McCullough, uh, who is the property owner. And the purpose is to install a, uh, I'm gonna amend this. We talked about this last meeting. It ends up being about a 10 foot wide by 27 foot long driveway, which puts it to the base of the stairs to the side entrance. Um, on the left side of a single family dwelling, which terminates in the side yard, not leading to a legal parking space. With me, well, Miss McCullough. Let's see who we have here. So we have a caller on the line. Do you mind pressing star six to unmute yourself and letting us know who you're here for or what case you're here for? So if your phone number ends in 9807, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, we can Ms. hear you. Miss McCullough. Uh, I'm here for uh, the last one, case nine, I think it is, 965 Monroe Avenue. Great, and what's oh. your name? Vincenzo. Okay, thank you. Um, Matt, Tyrese, we do not have anyone here for case number three. Okay, okay. thank you, thank you, Anna. Um, you guys do can- any, Do we have any public comment for case number three? No, nobody signed up to speak and there was no additional public comment beyond what was submitted last month. Okay, so we're going to close case number three. Um, hold on one second. Yep. Johanna, um, they can still deliberate after, or do they need to do anything now if they choose to make a deliberate? Okay, we'll talk about that in deliberations. <laughs> All right, we'll go to case number four. Uh, there is no sorry, case for Sorry, Matt. Um, I deliberate now is that I'm sorry, I'm not understanding no, what you're talking No, no, no. I, I guess I was just going to say, do we need, they can still deliberate at the end during the regular deliberations? Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah, or, yeah. or decide to wait to give the applicant a chance to come back? Yes. Okay. okay. Yep. I, just I don't, to I don't know if there's any, yeah, I think. You got everything think, you need. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I, yeah, there's nothing pretty much else. I don't. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I just want to make sure. Um, there is no case for tonight, 51 Katy Street. The applicant um, asked to uh, have his case postponed and there was no public input and no one signed up to speak. So that brings us to case number five, which is 100 Atlantic Avenue. It is an area variance request and the file is V-021-2122. The property is located in the R2 medium density residential district. The applicant is the property owner, Melba Burke. And the purpose is to legalize a driveway in the rear yard of a two family dwelling, uh, which exceeds the lot coverage requirement. And I do believe we have Melba with us. There she is. Okay. Uh, Melba, you are in. You can go ahead and unmute yourself in the lower left corner there. Hi, how are you? Hello. Yes. Okay. How you doing, Ms. Burke? Can you hear us? 
Am I muted? No, I'm not muted. No, you're not, Tyrese. Miss Burke, hi, are you with us? Yes. I'm okay, sorry. how are you tonight? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Let's swear you in and let's get started. So can you raise your right hand? Do you yes. solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, um, just a quick question for you. Did you post your required sign for this hearing? Yes, I did. Can you state on the record where it was posted? It was posted on the back of the house right by the driveway. Okay, thank you very much. You have 15 minutes. Go right ahead and, and explain your case to us. Okay, I'm asking for zoning to for the driveway because um, this would not impact the um, community in any way. You know, because 90% um, of the houses on, on the back of the house, Merriman Street, has driveways. And um, it would take up, you know, just one parking lot, mm -hmm. one parking spot of which I normally use. Is. And um, another thing why I, um, you know, think that it would be um, necessary for me, being a senior, and the, 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 the um, area is becoming very, very um, com um, impacted with traffic and it's, it's, um, it's becoming dangerous. I've had my car smashed a couple of times and windows knocked off. My son's car was a, right now it has a, someone hit it and hit and run in the front because um, the, the area there is so busy with traffic. And, um, you know, so we think, thought, when I first purchased the property, they told me that I could put a driveway in there. And then, um, you know, the time came where I felt that it was necessary because it was becoming harder for me and my grandchildren to get in and out of our vehicle on Atlantic Avenue because of the, the, the busyness of the street. It's been um, having a lot of accidents there. And, um, you know, I just, you know, thought that that area there would be better for me to have something in the back of the house where it would not impact the, you know, change the environment in any way. And it would also help us, you know. Well, you know, I've, and it's also less stairs for me to climb. Being um, I uh, sort of partial disabled, so it would help me to get in and out of my house, taking in groceries, especially since they put in that curve of the corner, extending it, taking away the parking. That was making it easier for me to get in and out of my house with the gro groceries and stuff. So you know, this was becoming very hard for me. During the winter times, I can't find anywhere to park because it, I'm plowed in with the traffic, with the, with the snow plowing me in, and um, trying to dig my car out is, is very difficult. So, you know, I would appreciate it if you guys, you know, allow me this opportunity to keep this driveway. Okay, anything else? You all set? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, the board's gonna have some questions for you. We're gonna start with our toughest board member first, and that's Cora. All right. <laughs> I'm not tough, I promise. <laughs> um, <laughs> excuse me. So our, is the idea just to pay over pave over what is existing, what we're looking at right now? Yes. And then maintain that little is this sidewalk where like the table and the garbage cans are? That's like a little pathway. Yes. Okay. And then the there's still some green space in between the end of where the driveway would be. The other picture shows it in between there and the fence. Yes. There's still some green space, right? Yes. And then like a little bit of yard. I'm just trying to remember the picture from when I went over there. Yes. Um, okay, and how many spots would this be? Just one? Just one. Okay, and then does the other side have any parking? There's no parking no. on the other side of the property, right? No. Okay, is the other side of the house occupied? Um, yes. It's a, it's a double, right? Yeah, it's a double. Okay, so it's you on the one side and the other side is occupied. Yeah, it's up and down. Oh, okay, up and down, all right. Um, okay, 
I think that's all. Thank think you, Cora. Joe? Uh, just want to clarify one thing Cora said. Um, is there a fence going up between you and your neighbor to the north? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's no fence proposed. You're talking about right? this area. Back in yeah, the it, yeah, there's no fence there. Okay. What are we looking at here? Right, right exactly. This right. is if you're standing on Merriman looking along the driveway. Mm -hmm. So to the right is the first house on Merriman. And then this is like the back entrance. So the fence runs along her, I guess it's the west side property line. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. That's the back. Okay. Um, yeah, because according to the, the um, instrument survey map that she included in her uh, application, it looks like she's paving right up to the property line. Yeah, so what will happen, that's a good point, um, Joe, is, I mean, regardless of uh, if, if the board is inclined to approve it, what will have to happen, because it is going to be quite tight, um, the survey shows 11.1 feet from this wall of the house extending northward to the property line. Yep. So once you subtract out like probably what, two and a half, maybe three feet of sidewalk that leaves you with maybe eight or nine. So it's going to have to be measured by the inspector. Um, okay. You do the math. Yes, correct. So yep. that, that will definitely have to be addressed. Okay. Um, once you, you subtract that out. Yep. That's all I have. Thank you, Joe. Um, Holly? Yeah, is there a curb cut? I mean, obviously you put down some gravel or something already. Is there a curb cut that's allowing you to get in there or are you driving over? Yeah, yeah it's a little curb cut. But it was low before. So where did the, sorry, Holly, I don't want to jump no, in. That's the same no, question I had. Where did the curb cut come from? I'm just totally confused about that. Was the curb cut done by the city? No, it was done by the person that did the driveway for me. And Matt, Matt from City of Rochester. So DES allows contractors. No, no. Okay. The, the they have to request a permit. They would request the, they'd request a permit for a driveway, and it would be subject to zoning code as well as getting a permit from DES permits. Um, DES permits has a list of contractors that are authorized to do work. They have all their insurance on file, but they have to get that permit. So if this was approved or approved on some condition or whatever tonight, she would then have to be linked with DES to get the proper permitting to legalize and make sure the work that was done is in accordance with the city standards and the right of way. Okay, because I, I thought it wasn't when I went out there. So thank you. Howard. Yeah, that, yeah, they would. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, Matt, any questions? Um, well, just for the... I'll raise the question. I, I don't expect to have an answer, but um, have you spoken to your neighbor to see if it would be possible to um, just to get them to sign off on uh, extending the property line? I know that there would be a there's a the, a long process in making that happen, uh, so that you're not um, you wouldn't have to be limited in terms of um, the I think the proposed is ten feet. Uh, the width of the driveway versus the eight or nine feet that you would possibly have. <clears throat> um, I think, I don't know if that's a possibility, but I would certainly suggest that you explore the topic. Okay. Uh, that way you're not limited in terms of the, the size of the vehicle even. Uh, just, just a thought. But uh, beyond that, I don't have any questions or comments. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you, Matt. And David? Uh, no questions. Okay. I don't have any additional questions either. Is there any public comment, Matthew? Yes, there was a person who signed up to speak. Let me okay. see. Uh, my technology team. They is aren't here, me. Matt. They're not here? No. Okay. All right. So no, no additional public comment. Just the written comment you all received, but the person that signed up didn't show. Okay, um, Ms. Burke, we don't have any additional questions. I gotta, you know, make sure you, uh, make sure you got a good contractor. That's the only comment I'll give you. <laughs> Thank you. I don't love the one you got right now. Just throwing that out there. Uh, so have a great Thanksgiving, all righty. Thank you so much. All righty, bye-bye. Right now. 
All right, we'll get started with case number six, which is an area variance at 1400 Mount Hope Avenue. File number is V-022-2122. Uh, the property is located in the College Town Village Center District. The applicant is uh, B. Walters, the property owner. I do believe tonight her architect, Randy, is on with us. Um, and the purpose is to legalize three attached non-illuminated window signs for Mamasans located on the north, west, and south building elevations, exceeding certain sign limitations and not meeting certain non-residential and mixed-use building standards. And Randy is with us tonight. Hello. Hi, Randy. How are you? Good. So Randy is the, Randy, what are you again? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am the architect. Architect. Uh, I'm sorry. Yep. I am. I are we doing a swearing in? Yes, we are. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. 15 I, minutes. Go right ahead. I didn't realize my video wasn't on there. There we go. Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, <laughs> um uh, Mama Sans, uh, as you, hopefully you know, uh, uh, moved from Brighton back into the city of Rochester. Uh, this building was built in, I believe, the early 80s uh, at 1400 Mount Hope Avenue. It was uh, Brugger's Bagels uh, building for many years. Uh, Brugger's went out of business, left that site. Um, it was being used for a while. Uh, B bought it, I think about 10 years ago. Uh, she had a tenant in there um, that uh, was not really working out. This uh, when when the Daniele's purchased her property uh, from her in Brighton for the Whole Foods project. Uh, this became the the uh, intended goal to hear the new Mama Sans uh, location. Um, so uh, what you're looking at there, uh, if you can believe it or not, is about $650,000 worth of investment in that building. Um, we uh, completely replaced mechanicals. We installed a drive up window in the back of it. Uh, the whole building was painted. It looks a little bit darker in those photographs than it, than it truly is. Um, but in the process, uh, my clients uh, uh, chose to uh, buy a blackout film treatment. Um, you can see that window on the corner there, uh, just to the right of the bus stop sign, is blacked out. Uh, at their final CFO inspection, I'm sorry, and they also put the three window signs on that you can see. There's one on the right side there on the side of the building. There's one at the far left of that photograph that you're looking at right now. And there's one around the corner on the north side of the building. Um, they were, uh, when they uh, did their um, uh, CFO application, the, uh, it was noted that they had put these uh, signs up and uh, we, we have proceeded at present under a, a conditional CFO. Um, what they we, we presented this uh, signs and the blacked out windows to the project review or design review committee, project review committee, I think it is. Um, they uh, did not like the blacked out windows. Um, I would like to say the blacked out windows were done uh, because that's a storage room in that corner uh, of the building. Um, but uh, my clients had agreed to come back in and remove the blackout film and hang blinds in the windows, just like they have in the rest of the windows on the front of the building. Uh, those blinds are uh, being manufactured now. So what we did decide to do, the, the um, uh, project review committee uh, had said they didn't mind the signs. Um, they, uh, they, they did question some of the things on the signs, um, but, uh, I think their biggest problem was that they blacked out the windows with the signs. So I would like to just make note that your staff report says that I'm requesting these signs on these windows with, um, with the blackout film on the sign. And that's not what we're asking for. Uh, in my, uh, uh, project uh, description uh, or, and the application, um, what, we, what we are planning to do is actually leave just the opaque letters and take the blackout film off. So for instance, in that photograph you see right there, there would be the Mama Sans logo, the words Mama Sans, and the easy to go, the phone number, and the website uh, address on there. Um, but all of the black around it would be removed so that it's clear glass. So those are essentially an applique on clear glass. Um, the other thing that I would like to 
uh, clarify with you is that I gave you numbers for this in two different manners. Um, as an architect, I look at this and I say, well, this is the entire opening is a window. These are uh, muntins within that window. Um, for instance, in your house, if you have a double hung window and it's got muntins in it, uh, dividing a, a sash up into multiple panes, then um, you, you you don't call each one of those a window. You call the whole thing a window, and those are individual uh, panes or lights within that window. So I gave you numbers on my elevations in both directions here. Um, uh, one is looking at the wind, the sign area as a percentage of the overall window, and the other way is looking at it as a percentage of the individual light that the window is part of. Um, the staff report was written with only using those numbers for the individual light. Uh, the, these signs are considered window signs. They're not the main advertising sign for the building. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you need me to go through the individual, you know, each side, uh, the numbers are on the elevations that I provided you in my report, and you can see them there. Uh, if, if we, I, I would like to point out that uh, we are allowed to have 25% coverage of the window with window signs. Um, and in this particular instance, we only have these signs in a couple of the windows, the, the three larger ones. And then uh, you saw in the previous one that Matt had up there, the, there's a couple of like neon, uh, a faux sign and, a, and another sign in there. Um, the, the, the intent here is not to put more signs in these windows. Uh, we like the big open glass uh, on the rest of the windows there. Uh, it looks great from inside, but I think it looks great from outside. Uh, we only want to do these three windows. So while our percentage exceeds the amount um, uh, you know, allowed for uh, a window, whether it be the light or the entire window opening, um, the intent here is to only have these three. And we'd be more than willing to, if you were to consider granting our request, uh, to have that be a condition that there not be any other signs in any of the other windows uh, that uh, just be limited to these three. The owners believe that this provides an advantage to the business. Uh, there's a lot of foot traffic in this neighborhood. It gives an a, a email uh, and, or a, I'm sorry, a website and a telephone number for ordering. Um, that uh, they've found many of the students uh, that attend the U of R who are in this neighborhood regularly use that information. Um, they, they, you know, it's, it gives a, a good identity at street level. The sign on the building you see in the upper left there is a sign we moved from Mount Hope Avenue. It's a, an artistic sign. It looks, uh, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's not a huge eye catcher. I think it looks great on the building, but it does not as, uh, it doesn't convey that information that they wanted to put out there with the website and the telephone number. Uh, I think it'd probably be best if I answer any of your questions at this point then. Thank you, Randy. I will say, um, black film makes it it's definitely makes it it's, makes it it's going away different. makes it a little it's, bit different <laughs> it's going away that black film will not be on there it makes it much different uh and yeah. i i agree i think there's a, a big push to pick up orders so i know that's a big push in the bit in just the food service business yeah. so let's start with uh joe this time Any this is matt joe? This oh, is Matt Staff. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I need to make a few clarifications to this application. Hi, Randy. Go ahead. Randy, Hi, Matt. A question, a couple questions for you. So I, I'm looking at the, the Mount Hope elevation right now. So there's there's the sign on the side with the blackout film here. Yes. There's blackout film on each one of these cracks or windows. Yes. There's blackout film here. Yes. And then there's blackout film on the northern elevation here. Right. Okay, so then you're saying the application entails removing the blackout film, just leaving like the vinyl decal sign? Absolutely correct, yes. On, on here, on the Mount Hope elevation? Correct. On here, and removing this blackout film? Yep, there are blinds that have been ordered for those. I went over and had a heart-to-heart -heart with uh, B. Walters and said, just order the darn, darn blinds. Okay, <laughs> so... so, yes. so um, That's right. We, we didn't apply for the blackout. I mean, it says in my in my letter that that accompanied the application that it simply will be the applique letters, the opaque applique letters, and not, you know, there's no background. 
Okay, so we can adjourn this one. I do not believe you need a variance. My apologies on behalf of the office. Um, you can use your windows as long as you're not covering more than 25%. It was my understanding that what was happening here was the blackout on the windows was treating as basically a removal of a window and then attaching a sign. But if you're no, actually I... removing the, uh, so like, for example, this was as if like the window doesn't exist anymore. It's blacked out. You're putting yeah, an no. additional sign on there where there's no rights to it. But right. that's not what's happening. Right. Okay. No. Matt, why don't no. why doesn't the uh, the board consider adjourning this for one month for removal of the blackout part of okay. the of the on, on the windows? And if they are removed, then we can then just withdraw the application. Yeah. I sorry, this is Anna Keller. I'm staff to the project review committee. I just have a quick question. Is this mm -hmm. variance does this variance cover the 25% window? I it's my understanding that the existing window signage exceeds that 25% threshold. Are you asking me, Anna? So is that part of this application? So I'm going to read what the staff report says, and then I'm going to have Randy um, address that. So the, the code compliance section of the staff report, um, just like I described, it basically says that the first one that's listed here for the um, variance that's required as if this window is being removed and that's a sign. So I, I don't think that's applicable in this case. The second one is what Anna is referring to in terms of the percentage. So Randy, can you talk about the percentage of, of the um, vinyl decal on the window here for the percentage up to 25%? I, I can, and but we have to have an understanding of what it's a percentage of um, the, 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 if you look at this uh, photograph you have here right now, to the far right left, yep, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, to the far left, um, there is a sign there. Um, there's, uh, if it's an individual light, that upper, there are two lights in that window. There's an upper one and a lower one. Um, mm -hmm. The upper window, uh, the upper light is 24.8 square feet. Um, and the sign is 15.1 square feet. So that's 60.9% of that, of that light. If you look at it as the whole entire window there, um, we're 37.5 square feet of glass with a 15.1 square foot window sign. So that, that means it's 40.3. And the, the other two are much less percentage. Uh, the one on the right side that you see there, if you look at it as the entire window, we're at 22.9% of the entire window, 67.4% um, of the actual light that it's part of. And then the one on the north side um, is, uh, let me see here, the, it were 26% of the entire window the and 60, yeah, that's the north side, we're 26% of the window and 62.6% of the light, uh, of the actual light. I um, understand. Yeah. So no, I what, appreciate and that. my point was though, that I can cover 25% of all of the glass if you, you know, each window, 25%, mm -hmm. that's a much larger amount of signage. Also yes. quite, quite sloppy looking and mm -hmm. not, not the intent here. What we would like to do is have that, what you see right there, that white logo, the white mama sans, the letters, just as mm -hmm. the letters themselves on that glass with no background. I think there still is the requirement for the variance for that coverage uh, as, as it's been requested. I understand. Let's um, let's do this. Let's um, give me one second here. Sure. Uh, I just want to verify the northern one, the north elevation window. I think we should go back to what um, Johanna said and adjourn this, and then yeah, I agree. I agree. And we'll go. And we'll go that be, way. And I hate to do that to you, Randy. And you know. That's on the city, it's, not on you. So. That's that's fine. We have we have we're, she's operating there. We have the conditional CFO, yeah. um, and I'm sure the 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 um, uh, the folks that are in charge of that will be lenient on us as they know we're in the process here. Um, so uh, I believe Randy, the blinds have come in. Yeah, Randy, I'll yeah. touch base with you tomorrow. Sure, not a problem. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Randy. Appreciate yep. it. you thank you for hearing us. Take care. Alrighty. Bye. We're going to adjourn case number six. Do we need to take a vote on that, Matt? Um, I don't.
But does anyone have any objections to it? Is there anybody here to speak on this one, Matt? Oh, uh, no, there's no um, there's no one signed up to speak for this case. All right. Why don't we just make a motion to adjourn it and and uh, state the date and. Oh, okay. So the motion would be to adjourn it. And if it needs to come back, it would be at the December 16th um, zoning board hearing and saying the date now means we wouldn't have to send postcards if it does actually have to come back. So the motion would be to um, adjourn it until the December 16th hearing if it needs to come back. So I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Okay. And all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Randy. Have a happy Thanksgiving. You too. Okay, case number seven is file number I'm B dash. I'm sorry. Fucking idiots. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I mean, Randy, you're still on the call. Of course. Of course. Randy, you're still on the call. <laughs> Uh, Can the technology staff move him out, please? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, he's gone. Case number seven is file number V-023-2122. The applicant is the property owner, Brendan Ryan. The project address is 169 South Union Street. The zoning district is the R2 medium density residential district. The uh, request is to construct three single family attached dwellings, not meeting certain lot area and yard um, and parking requirements. And we do have Brendan here. Brendan, is uh, Jenna here also? Uh, yeah, Jenna is, and I believe Dan was as well. Oh, and Dan, I'm sorry. I oh, I see Jenna. Okay, so there's three people Jenna's here. I don't think Jenna's planning on speaking, but. Okay, we'll put her here. So there's three people here. Um, in the event that they speak, we can swear all of them in. Okay, Brendan, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I see you got all your peeps to write comments in, man. You gave me more reading to do. <laughs> so uh, who's speaking tonight? Brendan, I see Daniel, and who else? I think it's just the two of us. Okay, so can you both raise your right hand? Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. yes. That's so serious. Go right ahead. Have fun. 15 minutes. Go ahead. Well, I think I'll start. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Brennan. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of Brendan Ryan for uh, the application for 169 South Union Street for area variances to allow uh, three attached townhomes to be built on the property. Um, as you know, we're seeking area variances for um, certain lot requirements, both the front and rear setbacks for each of the three um, new lots that we're seeking to create, and also uh, for a variance from the parking requirement. Um, the parking will not be provided on premises for these um, three townhouses. They will be parking will be provided on the adjacent uh, property, um, and so. Um, Brendan is also uh, obviously with us here today. Um, he's going to get into a, a brief um, overview of, of the project and a, and a history of the project. And um, um, then I'll talk a little bit about the legal standards and then we can take uh, questions from the board. So uh, Brendan, do you want to go ahead and, and um, get into the uh, background of the property? Sure. So first of all, I, uh, I sorry, I, I heard on the pre-meeting that my sign had fallen over apparently um sorry about that i had it was standing on sunday that was the last i saw it um sorry about that um but anyway yeah so i bought this property last year um and i wanted to kind of see what i could do with the vacant parking lot there um the uh the neighboring house which i own as well um, is just a one bedroom single family house. And there's about 4,000 square feet of parking lot, which is crazy. And, you know, it's really, it's basically vacant and unused, unused because, you know, it's only a single family house. Um, so I kind of wanted to see what better could be done with the lot. You know, I'm, 
I'm interested in, you know, urban planning and help to helping to um, return some more housing of moderate density into the city. Um, you know, it's in line with the comprehensive plan and just with in general good neighborhood design. Um, and it's also just the the vacant lot is kind of unsightly. It's you know you all you see from the street is the backs of the garages behind the houses. Um, so I thought it would be good to put something in there. Um, the lot has actually been vacant all the way back since the 50s um, when Union Street was extended from 490 to um, to meet Union Street as kind of the one way off ramp from 490. So it would be kind of a challenge to figure out, you know, no, no one had figured out what could be done there before, um, but I figured I should find something. And, um, you know, there, it was originally, there originally were three houses there fronting Pearl Street. Um, that's, it's kind of this strange triangular lot that's made up of the remnants of three old, um, you know, typical rectangular city lots. Um, so I looked at a couple different options and ended up deciding that the three townhouse design was what I wanted to go with, um, was kind of the most in line with what's in the neighborhood. Um, you know, there's Wadsworth Square has a lot of townhomes. Um, it's a very similar style development and the townhomes are actually the most um, prevalent uh, building type in the neighborhood aside from multifamily rental properties. Um, so I figured, you know, that wanted to design it similarly to what was existing in the neighborhood, both in the built form and the actual design of the property. And I think uh, my architect uh, party, party and Jenna on the phone um, did a really good job with designing that. Um, so my decision was mostly, you know, both that and as well as um, just for, from a financial standpoint, this is really the only project that I could make work out. Um, and that I think I'll, you know, be able to make the project feasible. And also there was, because of the weird um, shape and size of the lot, it's actually, there is not a single possible design that could actually be done on this lot without a single variance. Um, I think the, the lowest I got was two out of you know, any of the designs I looked at, regardless of whether they'd be even financially feasible, um, it's not even possible to, to build a development there without a single variance. Um, so I wanted to, even though it added more variances um, that I needed to request, I wanted to build this in a way that instead of um, building it as a rental property, I wanted to uh, subdivide the lots and sell, be able to sell them individually as owner occupied units um, to kind of, you know, I figured the neighborhood um, organization would have less concerns with owner occupant housing um, and also just a lack which affected me. I, when I moved to the city, I actually was kind of hoping to buy a townhouse or a duplex or something like that. And there's really, very little available of that sort of housing, the kind of smaller, more moderate density type housing um, that is owner occupied. It's basically all rental. And I figured that this would be a good opportunity to add a little bit more of that to the city, um, get a bit of a different, um, you know, diversify the housing stock a little bit more and just generally bring a few more people into the neighborhood um, in a well-designed housing. Um, so there's basically four variances that we're, that I'm asking for. Um, one of which is the front setback, um, which the requirement is 20 feet. There's actually not a single building in the entire Wadsworth Square neighborhood that satisfies that. Um, and of just over 45% of the buildings in the neighborhood have three or less feet setbacks, including all eight of the properties right along Union Street that are you know, in line with where I'm building, would be hoping to build this. Um, 
and then the lot coverage variance that I need on the center unit, um, the 65% lot coverage is actually lower than the lot coverage of any of the other townhouses that exist in the neighborhood. Um, so I, I think these are very much, um, you know, in line with the built environment of the neighborhood, the, the actual, you know, kind of spirit of the zoning code is, you know, make your properties kind of in line with um, the existing built environment. And I think that this really would. Um, additionally, you know, as Dan mentioned, the, the plan for parking would be to give one um, parking spot on for each of the units on the existing lot uh, 53 Pearl Street. Um, it'd be in the, the three car garage that is existing back there and just kind of um, giving an easement to each um, townhouse owner to have one parking space in that garage. Um, and as, as we have you know, it was mentioned before on the meeting, you know, cars should not drive to drive development. Um, I think that this is plenty of parking for the area. Um, on street parking isn't even that heavily utilized in that area. Um, and I think one off street parking space is, is plenty per. Um, it's also, it's one of the lowest car ownership areas in the city. And I, I believe it's almost 40% of. Uh, residents of this area do not own a car based on the census data. Um, so I, I think that's kind of all the points that I wanted to hit on. Um, you know, I, th I think that the these variances will allow a project to go through that definitely it's, it's really, I think, just about the only way to make a development here work. And I think it could be a really good addition to the neighborhood. And I'll just briefly follow up um, on the legal standards. Um, you know, I, I know it was mentioned in the, the pre-meeting about the, the sign falling over. Um, as Brendan mentioned, the sign was posted on the property more than 20 days ago. Um, it, it was uh, up as of Sunday. It's been up at various times. And so I, I think we've substantially complied with the, um, with, with the notice requirements um, under the city code. Um, and as far as the, the standards for the area variances, um, I think that this, this application is pretty clear that the benefit to the applicant substantially outweighs um, any perceived detriment to the, um, to, to the surrounding neighborhood. Um, as Brendan stated, there's really no way to, to build anything on this pre-existing lot that complies with the code. And so the benefit to the applicant for all of these requested variances is, that it, is it allows the applicant to use his property. Um, a denial of, of any of these variances is essentially saying that the applicant can't use the property for anything. Um, and then it, it's been vacant for 70 years that it has to remain vacant for another 70 years. So I think that that's, um, that's pretty clear um, that we've met that, that, that first standard. Um, it will not produce an undesirable change in the essential character of the area. There are, there are numerous um, properties, residential properties in the Wadsworth Square and Meg's Pearl area that do not have their own off street parking. Um, there are numerous examples on South Union Street and on Pearl Street of, of residential and, and commercial properties that have zero front setback. So I think this is in keeping with the essential character of the area. Frankly, I think it's, it's better that, uh, that um, this proposal is made without front setbacks. Um, and it's the same with rear setbacks. So I think we've clearly established um, that second element. The third element, uh, no other um, feasible means for the applicant to pursue. Um, again, I'd go back to the, the initial argument that we made that, that without the granting of these variances, there really, is, um, there really is nothing else that can be built on this pre-existing vacant lot. Um, on Union Street, um, I think Brendan's done his due diligence and, and there really is nothing that would comply with the code. And so that we have to seek, uh, we have to seek these variances from the zoning board. Um, none of these variances are significant. I think the, the numbers um, on the, the setback variances speak for themselves. And, and then to the parking variance, um, um, I, would, I would note that the applicant's gonna provide 
parking on the, the property that's directly adjacent um, to this one. And so that it's really all we're asking for is that we'd be allowed to park on a separate parcel. It's within feet of the building. So it's not really substantially different than providing it um, on site. So it's, it's, it's not significant. The, the requested variance will not have any adverse effect on, on the physical envir environmental conditions in the neighborhood or district. In fact, I think we'll have an overall benefit on the physical conditions in the neighborhood. You have an existing um, vacant lot. It's been vacant for a long time. It's unsightly. It's a blight on the neighborhood. And um, the new buildings, as I think you can see in the renderings that we've provided, are very attractive. And, um, and I think we'll improve the aesthetics of this neighborhood. Um, and then the final one, which we don't have to prove, but I think we've, we've established anyways, is that, this, that the hardship is not self-created. <clears throat> this is a pre-existing lot, um, that, that um, pre-existing non-conforming lot, frankly, that doesn't comply with the code and that doesn't allow um, anything to be built. And so um, any hardships have not been self-created by, by the applicant. Um, and so with that, uh, I think that is our initial presentation. I'll note that I also provided a letter of support because um, I live in the neighborhood. I own a, I own a property on, on Lawton Street. Um, I'm very familiar with this, with this area and with this lot. And um, as, a, as a concerned citizen outside my relationship with the applicant, um, I'm very much in favor of this, of this project being built. Um, I think it would be, I think it would be a huge uh, benefit to the neighborhood. Um, I haven't seen uh, new townhouses being built in this area in a very long time, and particularly um, owner-occupied, I think is great. I think that's consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, so with that, um, does the board have any questions for us? My first, so, oh, you're the lawyer who gets the haircut on Park Ave, right? How do you like it? That's yeah, right. you're the guy who got, yeah, you got that free haircut when you get it. I remember you now. You're I did kid. get a free haircut, honestly. I bet you did. After you gave it, I, I really did. did. Uh, good job, guys. Uh, let's jump over to questions. Uh, let's start with Holly. I actually don't have any questions because Daniel just answered one of mine in his thorough discussion of the standards, which I so appreciated. Those lawyers, you get those lawyers talking, let me tell you. Um, uh, let's go to Matt. Matt, any questions? I have no questions. Uh, David? I have no questions. <clears throat> uh, Cora? Um, I do have a question. So you guys, you said that you looked at all different um, options for the space and everything required uh, some level of variance, but this obviously was the most. What other options did you guys explore? Anything less than three units or just different con different configurations? Brendan? I looked, looked at both um, both single family and um, you know multifamily detached, you know, not a non-subdivided multifamily. Um, and just the way the the lot is shaped there's no uh, the the area that you can use is there, there's basically nothing that you can do without a variance at least two. Um, these are all two bedroom one bath. Yeah, uh, one and a half. But yeah, one and a half. There's oh, there's a half bath on the first floor. I didn't yep. see and then um, how many square feet are each uh, of them? Uh, it's nine hundred ninety six, I believe, for ba basically a thousand each. Um. Okay. Thanks. Joe, um, a couple, yeah, a couple things. Um, the first question to um, uh, your attorney's comment about parking in the adjacent property: How many spaces are available over there? Uh, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll I'll let Brendan answer that as well. But my understanding is that the the intention is to uh, record an easement um, over the, there's a, there's a three car garage. There's also additional parking spaces in the driveway um, on the neighboring property, which is, uh, I think it's 53 or 51 Pearl street. Um, and, but the, the, the parking that will be provided to these three townhouses will be in the, in the garage. Okay. Um, yes. But Brendan, did you have anything to add to that? Yep. That's correct. <clears throat> okay. Um, Matt, can you just scroll this site plan down a little bit? I want to talk to, uh, no, I need the site plan. I just didn't, couldn't see the whole thing, including the other property. 
There you go. Can so I hear you. I'm listening to you. Yep. Yeah, hold on, let me zoom. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah, so unfortunately, it's the scale that we got our, in our packages is a little difficult, but you could scale it out. I, I would like to talk about the whole site plan. Um, you talked about no other alternatives and things like that. And I was curious to know if you explored combining the properties, demoing the existing house and adding a fourth unit into the row of these houses and creating parking behind the building. Something similar. Let's see if I got this right. Brendan, was that considered? Is that feasible or? Uh, I mean, it's definitely by by the time you know that it was basically be demolishing a house that I just paid a hundred thousand dollars for. That would uh, that would basically increase the cost of each each unit by at least twenty five percent. And you know, I'm I'm generally in support of you know keeping our. The existing housing stock you know there's no no point in demolishing a, a house that's you know still good so brendan is that the the neighboring house do you have um existing um leases long-term leases in place for for that property yes and and, and so uh uh, Joe, I think that that might be one reason why that's not a, a feasible alternative is if, if he has um, if he has tenants in the property, um, you can't wouldn't be able to, to demolish the house. Oh, OK, because what I'm leaning towards is that you're basically asking for seven variances. You have two on unit one, one on unit two, one on unit three and three more on each of the units. That's technically like seven variances. And I was, I hear what you're saying and I'm not hundred percent sure where the 9.64 feet for unit one setback is, Matt. And it looks like that corner of that is way closer than nine feet to the property line, but I can't, I can't tell by the scale of my little drawing here. Hold so on, let I, me, let me. Oh, sorry, do you want me to answer it, Matt, or do you want to? Yeah, no, go ahead and point okay. out. I was just going to catch So up basically up. how, um, how the rear setback is determined on an irregular shaped lot, like a triangle, is that a, a line is drawn gore to the back of the property. Um, and so that that rear line is where the, uh, the rear setback is determined from. And so okay. you can see that line if you look, um, if you look the, the basically the, the hot, the top dotted line across the two parcels yeah. um, that is you know you can see the dotted gore line in the back yeah um, and so actually we could have if if we moved the whole pr uh, project up four inches um, it wouldn't um, it wouldn't even require a rear setback variance at all um, we okay. just want to I'm, I'm so I'm not sure if I follow that so man and unit one the northwest corner, what is the dimension from that corner to the property line? I can't read it on that little screen there. So you're measuring from here, correct? Yeah. But it's measured from the midpoint. Okay. Because- um, Is that what you mean? Yep. I, oh, I, sorry. I was looking at where it was measured from. Papers I, I had a feeling that's what it was, but I wanted to be sure I understood Yes, that. no, yes, yes, yes. Because okay. I, I guess, you know, I understand the financial implications of it, but if you were able to demolish that house, create parking back there, add the fourth unit on there, you need three, you basically need, you eliminate all the parking variances and you eliminate the setback variance. You would only need everything for the front, you just need three front yard setback variances, which I like the fact that it's pulled up to the street. So that's not a bad variance. So. I get, I get it. I just, I just wondered if there was, you know, you guys really did. Did you really explore other alternatives? And I'll just, I'll just add, you know, when we're looking at the whether or not the number of requested variances is significant. I, I mean, there we're requesting seven variances tonight, but but keep in mind, there uh, that's over three separate parcels, and so for each for each parcel, we're only requesting three variances. 
um, you know, the applicant could subdivide the property first and then request the, the setback and parking variances for each property. I think obviously this is the this is the more efficient way to do it. But um, I think it's it's not quite the same as saying that, you know, if you had one building that needed needed seven um, separate variances is a little bit different. So I, I don't think we've reached the, the threshold where you can say the number of variances requested is significant. But, but I, I certainly understand your, your point, Joe. Okay, thanks. That's all I got right now. But thank you, Joe. Um, I don't have any questions um, at this time either. Um, do we got, do we have any uh, public comment or call in? Yes, there's one oh. uh, call in. To speak. Okay. Let's uh, bring give it in. a second. Zoom is, Zoom is taking quite a while to actually get people back and forth. So bear with us here. Okay. It didn't used to take this long. He is here. Okay. Uh, Jason is on the call. Uh, Jason, you go ahead and unmute and the chair will swear you in. Jason, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Why don't you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I so affirm. Okay, three minutes, go right ahead. All right. Um, I did uh, submit some written comments. So if you folks have it in front of you, it would have been part of the additional comments and it'd be the one with the bullet points if you want to flip through it. Um, but I just did wanted to, uh, I think, we did a good job of speaking to uh, the variants, and um, I wanted to say I support the variants um, for a number of reasons, but I wanted to speak to um, not just to like the standard, but how it like improves um, the corridor as well, and then how well it fits with the um, comprehensive plan. Um, you know, that whole Union Street corridor um, is under probably the biggest infill in the history of the city, right? Um, and of course, this one isn't quite as massive or as um, glamorous as that, but it kind of just continues the momentum of that, of the inner loop fill project. And I think, you know, as those developments continue, that neighborhood of play and whatnot, it's gonna extend right down Union Street and along Broadway. You know, Broadway has got a lot of uh, vacant si on the south side that I'm sure will be developed as well at one point years down the road. Uh, but just speaking to the homes themselves, um, as I line the bullet points, um, um, they're the single family, they, that the fact they're attached townhomes um, are aligned with the placemaking plan, um, the 2034 plan, just to, um, keeping the housing stock um, in the city diversified while still being in line with the character of this neighborhood, which is great. Um, speaking to what Brendan said about being a homeowner, I bought my house um, two years ago myself, and I ended up buying a 2,000 square foot house just for myself. Um, I tried to find smaller stuff, but you know, I put in five bids, but I just couldn't get it. So it's kind of ridiculous that homeowners have to buy so much space um, that basically goes unused. Um, and then of course, uh, going back to the 2034 plan, um, the housing action plan portion of, the, of that 2034 plan, um, you know, the homes are a type that's creative and meets the evolving preferences of city residents like myself. Again, I would have loved to have bought like something a little bit more smaller. <laughs> Um, they meet uh, great urban design standards. Um, townhouses, I think, are something that are distinctly urban, especially once they're front the street like this. Um, you really don't see them in rural areas whatsoever. Maybe you see like a townhouse development in the suburbs, but you know, it's something that faces a front parking lot and it's just not um, quite the same as what we've got going on here. And then same thing, they just, um, the townhomes create an opportunity um, for low and moderate income households to buy a home. Um, again, I think they're smaller, they'll be a little bit more affordable, especially with all the development that's going on Union Street, um, just in general prices of housing is going up. So just having something in the housing stock, that'll be for working people in the neighborhood, it'll be great. Um, that's all I had to say. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You guys, uh, one thing I'll tell you guys is you got to come to the 19th Ward, man. It's the best neighborhood in the city. You know, we'll we'll treat you. We'll get you a nice little place in the 19th, but just throwing it out there. Tyrese, uh, I was going to say the same thing. We got little houses over here. Yeah, we got little houses, <laughs> but, you know, Brenda didn't want to build over there. I get it. I get what these guys, I get what these guys want to do. I get it. Matt, anybody else we got to bring in tonight for calling? 
Uh, no, no, no other oral testimony. Any additional comments to read into? Oh, you're not reading them into the record, correct? No, the um, additional are comments are on this. And we're not website. doing that moving forward, correct? Um, at this time, no. The plan is no. So the additional okay. comments were all provided to you. They're on the city's website for anyone okay. to reference. Per perfect. I just didn't. Okay, that's perfect. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, Daniel, Brendan, Daniel, haircut always looks good, my man. Uh, you all have a happy Thanksgiving, all righty? Thank you, you too. Thanks, you Thank too. You. Okay, uh, case number eight tonight is file V-024-2122. Uh, this is an area variance request at 235 North Winton Road, located in the C1 Neighborhood Center District. The applicant is anchor sign, Megan Jackson, and the purpose is to install three attached 113 square foot each internally illuminated channel letter signs for well now urgent care located on the east, south, and west elevations, exceeding certain sign limitations. We have with us. Who do we have with us? We have Kelly with us. Kelly? Can you hear me? Oh, yep. Now Hi, we can. Kelly. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Let's swear you in and get started. Can you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly okay. affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You have up to 15 minutes. Go right ahead. Okay. As we all know, I'm Kelly Matthijs, and I work for Anchor Sign, and our client is well now urgent care. I do, before I start, I wanna say that earlier during the staff meeting, I heard that there was a sign and I'm going to assume that that was a banner with maybe a coming soon. Um, that really has nothing to do with the signage we're proposing tonight. Um, I think usually corporate goes in and puts up banners, you know, letting everybody know that they're coming. Um, our position in this is we feel that urgent care is a very important business and they need the signage and they need it illuminated, especially at night in upstate New York where sometimes it's dark at 4 p.m. The well care will be open from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And we feel that having the illuminated light or signs will give everybody um, access to find the building. And what concerns me with this location is it sits on Witten Street, which there's no parking. It's only across the street from the well care. And then we would have to go over to Blossom down around and behind um, the gas station in order to get into that building where the parking is. And I feel even, even when you're coming down Blossom, having an illuminated sign on that back entrance would be easier for everybody coming down Blossom to see it. And also, also, um, um, North Winton Street or Road also. Um, in that time of need, I think we've all been there where you're rushing to some sort of urgent care. We realize that it's not a hospital, but usually a hospital is, is big and a lot easier to find than an urgent care. But nowadays, I think we all have a tendency to go to an urgent care because a lot of times you can get in faster and you don't have the weight. So I think we're moving on to the new era where we go for medical treatment in an emergency. And myself, as an older person, it's getting harder for me to see. And I feel in a neighborhood such as this, that having the illuminated lights would um, help people trying to find it. And after listening to all the other cases, it sounds like um, this is an area where there's I might shoot myself in the foot as far as traffic, but this is maybe more where people walk to stuff. Um, I know from a few of the comments that were received from the neighborhood that they don't want to lose the appeal of probably what I call Main Street USA. And for me, when I look at it, it looks like one side of the street is that and now they're moving the other side of the street to be more, for lack of a better term, modern. Um, we don't feel that the signage, we understand that it's over code, but like, you know, we've stated in all of our um, <clears throat> comments here is it is a medical office and we would like to be able to have the signage so that people can find it in that time of need. 
And I think that's basically it. <laughs> that's part of um, the site. Oh, I do want to, I'm sorry, I can't yeah. hear you, but I just, I do want to, I, I want to make one other comment as far as the size, um, the code, which is 25 square feet, that puts a 17 inch sign on that front elevation. And you, you guys were just presented with um, the variance, but that is a very small sign and the facade will swallow that sign. So I don't think if you're coming down that street, you're not gonna see that sign. Um, and I guess that's it. Does anybody have any questions? All righty. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. Uh, let's start with Matt. Matt, go right ahead, any questions? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm the square footage for the sign because the request says 113 square feet and then the uh, letter says 313. That's total because there's three signs. Okay, gotcha. Okay. We propose 36 inch signs and they're, each sign is 113 square feet. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't, there wasn't any sort of discrepancy there between the uh, the request versus what was in the letter there. So, okay, I'm all set. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, David? No questions. Uh, Corey? I don't have any questions. Joe? Um, yeah, how does this compare to the other locations? Is this a typical sign size? Kelly? Yes. Uh, oh, can Kelly, you can you hear us? Yep, we can hear you now. Joe said, is this typical signage for all urgent care location? Well, now uh, locations. I can hear you now. <laughs> can you hear uh, me this, now? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Joe, ask your question. Yeah, I was just curious, is this typical yes, this of is all your- this is a prototypical- your Prototype? Um, okay, because I have one close to my house that I drive by all the time. So I was just curious. Um, and, and it's my understanding yeah. there's no, there's not the sign on the north end, right? <laughs> yes, this is this is a prototypical sign. Okay, but there's no sign on the north north elevation. Okay, that's all. Uh, correct. Correct. So like the north the north elevation is is it buds up right to that a, a future building they're going to build, correct? So it's like a little alleyway sidewalk in between there, if I'm not Yes, mistaken. correct. Okay. Um, That's correct. And Holly, any questions? So the neighborhood is attempting to avoid the internally lit, lit signs and go with um, more, you know, potentially gooseneck lighting. Is that something that you guys would be willing to consider? I think she has a delay in the. Yes. That is something you're willing to consider, Kelly? I don't know if I'm delayed or you are all delayed, but yes, it is something we have done in other, um, especially in New York, we have, there have been where we've had to use the goose neck, like goose neck lighting. Thank you. And I don't have any questions. So Matt, do we have any additional comments? Uh, yes, we have two uh, call-ins for oral testimony. Hold on, we'll move people in here. Okay. God, Zoom used to be better a year ago. Now it takes forever to move stuff back and forth. Um, okay. Um, Mary, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and the chair will swear you in. Mary, how are you? Is this Mary Coffey? Yeah, she's on mute though, hold on. Okay. Is this for Marilyn Shooty? Hey, how are you oh, guys yeah. doing Marilyn, tonight? Mar yeah, go with Marilyn first, she's on, she's on oh, muted. Go ahead. Hi Marilyn, how are you? I'm fine. Okay, let's swear you in and get started. Can you raise your right hand 
Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, it is. Are you speaking as an individual or as a community association? Uh, North Winton Village. Okay, go right ahead. And Mary and I have submitted a letter. And yes, we are very much uh, concerned. As uh, you know, and hopefully the applicant realizes, North Winton Village prides itself on well, we've been working on this for decades to create a very village-like neighborhood, very reminiscent of the early 1920s. And as if you've gone out to see the site, you know, we have worked very hard with the um, developer to have this whole complex tie in with the 1920s uh, brick commercial building. And as you realize across the street is Mayor's Hardware and we understand from Tom, the owner, Tom Green, that he will be putting gooseneck lights on his building. And so we really want to keep this building, the well care, to fit in with the neighborhood. We don't want that brassy looking illuminated sign. We're not a suburban location. We want them to fit in with the neighborhood. And believe you me, the neighbors in North Winton Village who will be the ones that will be probably going to this location, they will certainly know where the location is. It will be no surprise to anybody. And of course, we are happy that the Well Now Center does have the classic uh, roof line that we so pride ourselves on. And so I just hope the applicant understands we don't like illuminated signage. We would prefer that the size of the sign fits in with what the zoning code is. We worked real hard to make sure that this uh, area where this property is going was zone C1 in the last um, zoning review in the early 2000s. So uh, please try to fit in with the neighborhood. Thank you. What happened? And I don't know. Mary is on here. Mary, you can unmute yourself in the lower left corner where the microphone is with a red line over it. Just click on that button and it should unmute you. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. And you? I'm doing well. Doing well. Good to hear from you. So why don't you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go right ahead. Okay, this is, uh, this is a development that's been going on for a long time. And uh, we thank the zoning department and we thank um, Kelber for working with us through the process and looking forward to working on other developments there. However, um, a, a lot of variances are needed. And um, again, uh, the building designs we've worked and worked on and, and we're just really thrilled with that. However, I, I'm just repeating what Marilyn has said. If you would like me to read the um, letter from the board, I would be glad to do that. What did you mind just summarizing for us? All right, let me summarize. Okay, the, um, the board would like to request that the well now signs have external lighting. We would also like to see gooseneck lighting. The building mirrors the buildings across the street. Mayor Hardware, which is now re re renovating, will also be putting in gooseneck lighting, which is part of the architectural era of many of the buildings already there. I think when we're through with this development, it is going to be a wonderful example a, a true urban village development, thanks to a lot of people. So we would like to see the, now, the, years ago they did um, the new CVS, they put the top on that too. Um, and of course, that now there was variances, and I thank the city on internal lighting. And um, their lighting was bigger, but that building is a lot bigger. You have to remember, this building is um, not that big. Um, so, um, in the letter 
from us, we believe that three signs are too many and will resemble an airport tower. Perhaps one on Wooden Road and one on the west side, rear sign, would be acceptable. The size of the signs, now I understand it is the size is what, 113 square feet, they mean for three signs together. Uh, when 25.5 of is what is accepted is much too large. CV, and I told you about CVS. So we would like to see the signs maybe 30 um, square feet. And we'd like two signs and we'd like to have them uh, external illumination and would like goose light night lights summarized in a nutshell. No, that makes perfect sense. And I, this board certainly hears that loud and clear, yeah. Mary. I want you to know that. Thank Anything you. else? I think that's it. And again, Pre thank you. No, thank you all for the hard work you're doing up there in North Whitten Village. We appreciate it. And you got you all have a happy Thanksgiving, okay? Thank you. Any other comments, uh, Matt? Uh, no, no other oral uh, testimony, just the written comments from North Whitten and then two other uh, property owners in the area. Um, Kelly, I'll give you a second to rebut that testimony. Um, just a quick question. Um, the internally lit well now signs that you're requesting, do those turn off after the business closes? Or do they remain on throughout the evening after you close? They, they can be set up to do that. Yes, sir. They, they can be set on a timer, um, but they, I think the plan is to be open until 11 p.m. at night. And I understand how on that front facade, how it does face where the hardware store, I think she said, is going to gooseneck lighting. And, and I know the, the side sign, they're not crazy about either, but um, <clears throat> after reading the comments, and if we were to propose something like going with a gooseneck light on the front facade and maybe doing an internally lit on the back facade where that parking lot is that kind of faces CVS who has the internal lights, that is something we could also do and maybe meet everybody in the middle. Um, as far as signage, this is our prototypical. So we would like to keep the size and maybe the side elevation sign needs to go away because it does butt up against that gas station. And I'm assuming that gas station is gonna stay. And then of course the other elevation, they're gonna put that two, I think it's a two story building. Right. So that is something that maybe we could meet in the middle and, and be considered um, at this time. Okay, but just to be clear, the lights, the lights can turn off after they close that event. Don't want the lights. And that's all I have. Okay. Um, Matt, I think we're all set here. And okay, then, so yes, then, sir. And then we could do that. Yes. If that's, if we were going with internally, we could put it in that they have to shut down at a certain time at night. They can be okay. set on timer. Okay. Yes. I, clear. Just want to make sure as we deliberate, you can't, you know, speak. So I want to make sure that we kind of flush every option out. For the board's consideration. So thank you so much, Kelly. You uh, have a happy Thanksgiving. <clears throat> okay, the last case this evening is case number nine. It's a use variance request at 965-969 uh, Monroe Avenue. Uh, the applicant is Tony Salino of SOS General Contracting. The zoning district you is too, C1. Thank you. C1 Neighborhood Center District, and the request is to establish the use of the property uh, is a multifamily dwelling containing five dwelling units, a use not permitted in the district. Um, and we have with us, I see Sharon on the call. Um, Sharon, how are you? Hi, good evening. I'm well. How are you all? I am well. I am well. So let's get you sworn in and get underway. So please raise your right hand. 
Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to provide, the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. 15 minutes, if you wanna use it, go right ahead. All right, thank you. This is actually a refiling of a variance, a rather old variance that was approved in 2016. Um, as we put in our application, this is a single family, a two and a half story single family home that was converted to commercial space at some time in the late 1960s. Um, it has had different lifespan in here where it was vacant, had some tenancy, then went vacant again. It's been vacant since 2014 with one exception of a, a small retail space that is also vacant again. So it hasn't functioned well ever as a commercial office space. Um, we're proposing to make this back into its original use, which was residential, and to make it multifamily with five apartment units. Um, there are some circumstances with the, the structure because it's a single family home. And we reference the fact that there's 36 inches above grade at the front porch area to enter into the home. And I think somewhere in the application, there is a picture of the front of it, I'm not sure. There's uh, the pillars and the, the very common front porch that you see. Um, Oh, sorry that you can't see a picture very well, but in order to make this a functional commercial space, you would have to do some dramatic, costly, and very uh, aesthetically displeasing type of ramps and structures to, to make this ADA compliant. It, it's just not functional uh, as a commercial space. So, um, in terms of the uh, inability to make this function that way, it's not something that was, uh, it's something that it, it, it has on its own, um, nothing that was created by the owners. The surrounding area is, uh, is high density, I believe it's high density residential and um, mostly apartment buildings. So this, this is home sits here quite unique from its surrounding uh, structures. Granting that to be a residential structure would actually make it more in line with what's going on on the street around it. Um, at the moment, we don't see of any other remedy that could make that function uh, you know, well as a commercial space. As I say, we are refiling what was a previously approved uh, use variance. I think that um, it just remains uh, unfunctional as a commercial space. Anything else? No, I think that's okay. it. Let's see. thank you so much. Appreciate your uh, presentation. Uh, David, any questions? Uh, yes. Um, before when the property was commercial, did you use any other upstairs portion as the apartment? This is a mixed use building. I am not aware that that is the case. Okay, that's all I had to know what use was it before as far as the commercial and was a residential mix in there before. Um, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Cora, any questions? I don't have any questions on this one, thanks. Joe, any questions? No questions. Uh, Holly, any questions? No questions. And Matt, any questions? No questions. I don't have any questions either. Do we have any public, anybody here to speak? Okay. Okay. Sharon, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me.
Have a happy Thanksgiving. Bye bye. Was, you as well. <clears throat> All right. So that will conclude uh, the hearing for tonight. Um, I need to just take a few minutes. Um, do you guys want to just do like eight oh five? We'll come back. Yeah, because I'm I'm okay. dying here. So yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's eight oh two. So we will. Um, you can stop this.